Okay, so I think it's time to start. So uh, we'll have uh, one lecture and one discussion this afternoon. So stay more tuned on more on two more days. So uh, then we'll be over, okay? All right, so uh, this afternoon, the first uh, the, the lecturer is uh, Diego. It's the third part of the Wilson No. Okay, thanks. Um, okay, so uh, let me remind you the results, the main, the main results from the first two lectures. So we consider a Wilson loop in the fundamental representation for the line, and we discovered that this was one. And then uh, the Wilson loop, uh, always fundamental representation, but for the circle, was some Laguerre polynomial, if you have done the exercise, but when n goes to infinity, is a, a Bessel function that can also be expanded when lambda goes to infinity as 2 square root of pi, lambda minus 3 quarters, p to the square root of lambda. OK, and then I've seen some people doing exercises diligently, and then if you have done it, you, you know uh, what these guys are. So the symmetric and the symmetric representation. OK, I'm not going to write down the result, but uh, we are going to recover it from supergravity. OK, so this is uh, what we had so far. So we were equipped with a set of exact results obtained using localization. <clears throat> and now the idea is to uh, recover these results from uh, holography. So I'm going to start part two of my lectures, which is holographic Wilson loops. And uh, okay, so we are in n equal to four super young males. And uh, the dual theory is type to be strings on ADS5 process five the string coupling is lambda over 4 pi n. And uh, the tension is it's given by this. OK, so, so this, this is the dictionary between the parameters. And OK, so in, in v n going to infinity limit, we have non-interacting strings. And on top of that, we can take the lambda going to infinity limit in which we have a supergravity limit. OK, good. So 2.1 is minimal surfaces. OK, so the question is, what is the holographic dual of a Wilson loop and uh, starting from the case in which the representation is the fundamental one. So this is the question we want to start with. OK, so let's remind, so what, what, So this is n equal to 4 severe mills in a, is a theory with adjoint fields. So all the fields, the scalars that we consider, the gauge field and the fermions that we didn't consider, but they're all in the adjoint representation of the gauge group. But we we, we probe this theory with particles that can be in any representation you want. So typically, you, as I told you, you think about particles in the fundamental representation, but you don't need to do that. You can be more generic. And uh, you can consider higher representations, different representation of these particles coupled to the gauge field. And so, and so essentially, what we are, we, are, we, are, we are testing, we are probing an adjoint theory with other particles in different representations. But in uh, uh, this theory, we don't really have particles in, uh, we don't have fields in the, for example, in the fundamental representation. So we, ha we have to, we have to, uh, int we have to understand what would be a, a, a heavy source in the fundamental representation in this holographic setup. So 
n equal to four superior males, all fields in the adjoint. Okay, uh, but so we can introduce a fundamental representation particles using the Higgs mechanism. So using Higgsing of membranes. So think about starting with a stack of uh, ND3 brains or if you want and one n plus one d3 brains okay and then you are going to have all possible strings right attached to this to this d3 brains but now let's do a higgs thing so let's uh, separate one of them from the others so we have now n d3 brains and one single d3 brain far away and so yeah, I, here I still have strings in the stack, but then I, I'm also going to have macroscopic strings stretching between the two, the two different uh, settings, okay? So this would be like breaking SU1, SUN plus one into SUN times U1. Or if you think about this thing as a matrix, you're going to have something like this, N times N block, a one times one block. So this would be n plus one times n plus one. And then you have two of diagonal blocks that uh, transforming the fundamental and anti-fundamental representation of this big block, which is n by n, okay? So we, we can call them like W bosons with some abuse of language, okay? So the endpoints of the string are going to behave like fundamental and anti-fundamental particles. And then, and these are going to be heavy because these are largely separated. Okay, so this is endpoints of this macroscopic string is going to be um, heavy particle in the fundamental. Should, I should write bigger. Okay, not whiter. White, white is, is white enough, right? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now, so what is the prescription then? If I want to compute this holographic with some loops, is to, um, <laughs> compute a disk, well, a string amplitude. So prescription, <coughs> compute uh, a string amplitude for a string landing on the Wilson loop contour that we called C. Okay, so now, now you see that this guy is a, so this is a, an heuristic argument, of course, but I mean, you see that this guy is a fundamental particle. Now you go through the new horizon limit, you create ADS5 cross S5. So this is going to be the boundary, and now you're going to have this guy propagate attached to the boundary. And uh, so it's an heavy particle in the fundamental representation of the boundary and the contour of this particle is going to give you the Wilson loop. Okay, so now we want to compute a string amplitude for a string which has an endpoint landing on the contour. So the expectation value then is going to be something like this. So we are going to have uh, uh, um, an integration over the metric, the embeddings, the fermions, of a string action as a function of a metric, embedding, and worship fermions, okay? So before we constructed the symmetric Wilson loop, you said, okay, we don't really know how to do it, but let's add 
add something else from the local plant, and we want to see what this is symmetric, and then we say, okay, this is using a build. And in case, I thought it said in principle, we could also add a mu plus, plus phi i, but and plus some fermion, maybe, and it might work out. But now, if you look at the holography, you have something very specific, I see. Well, it, 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 I, I don't know if it is very specific. So, in fact, so that, that, that coupling to the fermions is going to, sorry, to the scalars is going to appear in a moment. I'm going to go back to this point. But the fermion, you said the possibility of having a supersymmetric Wilson loop with fermions out of the force of young males, you don't really see it anymore, right? Um, other so, I mean, I mean, of course, it's, it's a string uh, partition function, so I have to integrate over all possibilities a priori. But, of course, I don't know how to do that. And then I'm going to take a limit now. But uh, OK, so this is a priori what you would expect from this picture, what, what you would expect you have to do from this picture, right? Yeah. But n n of course, but uh, bear with me for a moment. OK, so this is very difficult. But uh, um, we, can, uh, we can take a limit. So we can take lambda going to infinity, because now we have a, this becomes a subtle point so the saddle point is going to dominate, and the saddle point is just uh, the, a minimal surface. So this becomes the, minimal, the area of a minimal surface of the string attached to the Wilson loop. OK, so this is a classical string, classical string action, which is a minimal surface ending on the contour. OK, so now the contour, now we, we so I, I, I only wrote C, but actually we know that it's not just C, it's C and theta i. So theta i is an integral part of the contour. So, so far this is, again, it, it is very, very sketchy and it's not very precise. I mean, what, what I mean, which minimal surface? Then we, we see that we have to be more, more careful. And this is not precisely the right thing to compute. OK? But anyway, so this is, this is the idea. So, uh, so now you, let's think about this is the boundary of ADS. This was the circle C. And then you have some minimal surface, which extends in the, in the bulk. So because of the gravitational pull, the minimal surface is not lying on the boundary, right? There is some, it's like a catenary equation. So you have a, you have a it goes into, into the bulk. But when you have this uh, minimal surface, it has to be minimal because the saddle point, it has to land on this loop. But OK, so let's try to, to take this as a working uh, definition of what I have to do. OK. Well, after the new horizon limit, this essentially disappears. You, you, so, OK, good. So if, you, you, you would think that this, this string goes deeply in the infrared. Now if you take a, a close contour, somehow this, this thing, in order to be minimal, it has to close. Yeah, it, it's, it's not terribly very, it's, it's a little bit heuristic, yes. Yeah, so, so ADS has some gravitational pull toward the center. And, uh, just because it's ADS. Just because of the curvature, yes. So this guy doesn't want to stay on the, on the boundary. The minimal surface, you actually, you want to avoid as much as possible this region because this is the region of high curvature. And so you want to go, you want to go. Good. So now, And actually, I should say that Su Young, who is in the audience, yeah, where, where is it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, is uh, wrote one of the one of the two original papers about this. This so one is Su Young Ray and Yi, and the other one is Maldasen. <clears throat> okay, so uh, let me take Poincaré coordinates, and so.
so the boundary is at z equal to zero. And uh, so let, let me take worksheet coordinate, what I call tau and sigma. And okay, so this would be a, a string, but somehow the, the notion of a contour has to enter in this computation, and it enters through a boundary condition. So x mu at zero and sigma is little x mu of sigma. So the contour C was parametrized, if you remember, by x mu, and then we had this theta i. Then z of zero and sigma is equal to zero. And let me take big capital theta of zero and sigma, which has to be theta sigma, okay? So the contour enters through some, uh, some uh, um, uh, boundary condition. Okay, so now we, we understand this contour in this internal space gets interpreted. So theta i of sigma gets now interpreted as a contour uh, on Vs5. So in particular, theta i equal to 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 is a, uh, is a north pole of Vs5. So we just have a string which is sitting still at the north pole of Vs5. Good, so now, <clears throat> okay, so now we can, uh, we can essentially compute this minimal, this minimal surface. For example, we can use the Nambu-Goto action. So we have d tau, d sigma, square root of a determinant of gamma AB, where gamma AB is the induced matrix. So it's dA x mu, dB x mu, plus dA z, dB z, over z squared, you could use Polyakov action, doesn't matter. Very good. But now if you, if you try to go ahead like this, you uh, immediately discover that there are large volumes, so from the gravity point of view, infrared divergences coming from regions of small z, right? Because you are computing a minimal surface of something that lands on the boundary of the space where the curvature diverges. Okay, so um, we need to regularize. And also we need to understand what is, what is the meaning of this, of this divergence and so are, are we really computing the right object or not? So, but anyway, so for the moment let's regularize. So let's cut the surface at z equal to epsilon. So let me cut it here. So I got z equal to epsilon, and then I'm just going to integrate everything only up to, up to epsilon, then I have to do something, and then in the end I can, re I can take epsilon to, to, to zero. So <clears throat> you can understand the origin of this, I mean, you can understand the structure of these divergences in a, in a simple way. You just uh, do the, an expansion that is uh, it's in my notes. So structure of a divergence <coughs> essentially, okay, so you can use, for example, the Polyakov action, then you write down the equations of motion plus the Virasoro constraint, then you expand uh, these fields uh, close to the boundary. So the details are, are in my notes, but I, I, I'm going to, so I only, I'm going to go a little bit faster than in the notes because I want to emphasize another point which is not in the notes. Okay, and then, uh, um, 
Okay, so you, you, you expand this and you find, for example, that x mu tau and sigma is equal to x mu of sigma. So this is the, this is the boundary condition plus tau squared over two <laughs> x dot square sigma del sigma x dot mu of sigma over x plus or tau cube and so on. Z of tau and sigma is tau plus zero plus tau x dot sigma plus orders tau cube and so on. Okay. Okay, then you plug this into the action. And then you discover that the divergence goes like the perimeter of the curve, the length of the perimeter of the curve divided by epsilon, okay? So it's a linear divergence proportional to the perimeter. Okay, then if you want, you can, uh, you can say, okay, very good. So let's, uh, let's redefine what I mean by minimal surface. So the area of the minimal surface, you can define it as the limit epsilon that goes to zero of the area only computed up to epsilon minus the length of the curve over epsilon. So you can, you can give this proposal. Okay. But okay, so let's try to understand this, this point a little bit better because essentially we, we have been sloppy about boundary conditions. So this works, I, in, in practice is going to work for what I'm going to, to say today, but. Can I not interpret that as renormalizing the length of the string and that's it? Yes, you can think of it as, so you, you, are, you are inserting an infinitely heavy object in, the, in, the, in, the, uh, in, in your contour, so you can think of it as uh, renormalizing this, or subtracting this infinite object. But okay, so the, the thing is that, so. I think this is something that maybe Yanis is going to talk about. At least it was in his outline. I don't know if he's going to have time to do it, but so the Legion transform. So we, yes. So you start from zero. You don't have the, the linear term because essentially you want to avoid the region of high curvature as much as possible. So you go straight up, tau squared, plus all, plus all this tau cube. This is zero, the boundary condition, plus tau, plus all the tau cube. So there's no tau squared? No, there is not, there, there is not, uh, uh, no, maybe there is tau squared here, sorry. I mean, of course, there are two, there, probably, yeah. You, you cannot determine fully the, the, the expansion, of course, because you have two integration constants, but uh, yeah. it could be tau squared, yeah. Um, good. Okay, so the thing is that we have a boundary. So this opens up the possibility of introducing boundary terms, and boundary terms are important. And uh, of course, they do not change the equation of motion. So after you find a minimal surface, even if you include a boundary term, it's going to be the same equation of motion. It's going to be the same solution. But of course, once you have to evaluate the action on shell, this is going to change the result of the action on shell. So they change the on shell action. And the main point is the following. So a string landing on a Wilson loop obeys complementary boundary conditions than a string uh, on a brain, okay? So on a D3 brain, 
we have, uh, of course, four Neumann boundary condition and uh, six Dirichlet boundary condition in the transverse direction. For the string landing on the Wilson loop, we have six Neumann boundary condition and four Dirichlet boundary conditions. So let me give you just a, a, an heuristic way to understand how this uh, switching of boundary condition comes from. So let's start, let's start from a, like a D9 brain with a curve in, uh, in 10 dimensions. So you have a, you don't have any brain, or you have a space filling brain, you have a curve in 10 dimension, and then the Wilson loop is going to land, the, 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 sorry, the string endpoint is going to land on this 10 dimensional curve. So it's going to be 10 Dirichlet boundary conditions, right? Instead of having, because it has to land on, the, on this curve, so it is 10 Dirichlet boundary conditions. Without the curve would be 10 Neumann boundary conditions, right? So now do 60 dualities. So you end up with a D3 brain and you end up with, uh, with, uh, with uh, four Dirichlet and six Neumann, which is what I, what I wrote here. So the six Neumann, so the, the four Dirichlet are going to be the directions parallel to the, idea, to the ADS boundary. And the six Neumann are, is going to be the radial direction plus VS5, okay? So essentially what we were doing so far was wrong because we were using a Polyakov action or an Ambugoto action which is appropriate for the Schley boundary condition, but we have something which obeys different boundary conditions. So we have to do a Legend transform to compensate for, for, for this. So the Nambugato action is appropriate for so it depends on the, on, the, on the embedding coordinates, not on the momenta, right? For D boundary conditions. So we need to replace coordinates with momenta for the directions that switched boundary condition for the, for the direction that changed boundary conditions, okay? Yes? Doesn't this explain the absence of a linear term in the X, the presence of a linear term in the F coordinate? Because if you had a linear term in the X, that would, that would yes. be the first derivative. Right, the first right, 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 yeah. It, it has, yeah. So that's implicit in the solution? Yes, it is implicit in the solution, yes. In the boundary direction is, uh, di di uh, yes. Right. So you don't, yeah, so you can use Nambugoto for, for, those, for those embedding functions in those directions, but there is one embedding function which is, would be in the radial direction that for which you have to change the boundary condition. I, I'm going to write, write, write it now. Okay, so, um, So the string was sitting at a point on S5. So we don't we don't have uh, we don't have to we don't have to do anything about this S, the S5 direction. So the only coordinate to be replaced by its momentum is the uh, radial one.
so z, okay? So I need to add a term. I need to define pz. Some radial, uh, some, some normal derivative to the boundary. And then I, I need to define a new action, which is, was the, the old action with, with, a, with a Legend transform, okay? And of course, now if you if you do the if you do the, the variation, you are going to see that while this other while this guy was a function of z, this guy is going to be a function of p z. Okay. Okay. So after we do that, the action the the, the action is finite. And uh, and actually this. Sorry. Why is the sign in Yeah. So I'm I'm okay. So yeah, good. I'm. Uh, so this would be z p z, right? The Legend transform. But then I I it's a boundary term at epsilon at where I, where I cut my surface. I add this, and now the, uh, it's going to be finite. The second. Now the second term is going to be divergent, but it's going to be is going to cancel the divergence here. In the in the in the divergence of the action. And possibly give you a finite contribution sometimes. Okay, but now if you if you consider this legend, so the proposal is then the dual operate the dual uh, object, the holographic dual to a Wilson loop is not the minimal area, is the Legend transform of the minimal area. Okay, uh, uh, Yanis will, uh, will give you more details or not. Yeah. Okay. In that, in that direction, but uh, so you don't need to add the uh, Legion transform is. Okay, but it's analogous, I guess, to to. to it should, it should work. Yeah. Sure. Epsilon, yes. So this is this will be Z P Z, right? Legion transform is Z P Z evaluated in this uh, regula regulated surface. So z becomes epsilon. If you compute, so this is, of course, is d, I mean, v, v, this is going to introduce, is going to introduce someone over epsilon squared, whatever. Okay, so the important thing is that, uh, so if you, if you really expand, so let, let me actually expand this, uh, say, say something more. So uh, if you expand this guy, you're going to find that this is, there is a divergence, one over two pi epsilon, then the integral ds along the loop. And this integral is proportional to x squared minus square root of t, theta i theta i plus finite pieces. So you see that in general, actually, this, is, this, is, this doesn't, uh, doesn't solve the problem. It solves the problem for the supersymmetric loops that I was uh, introducing in the first. Uh, so if you remember in the first uh, lecture, we had that uh, a condition for supersymmetry is what the theta i theta i would be equal to one. So when, 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 when the loop obeys a supersymmetric condition, this is zero, the divergent piece is zero. So answering Jesse's question, so you see that uh, there is some, this is a more defined definition which knows about the supersymmetry of a loop. Okay, good. But anyway, so let, for, let, let's, given this, uh, this uh, digression, let's just take this uh, prescription that I'm subtracting the length of the curve over epsilon. Yes? Yeah, did you have any expectation that it would be finite only in the SUSI case and not in the non-SUSI case? Because it looks like... Well, I know it from the gauge theory, but in the gauge theory, the Wilson loop is in general, so if you, only, if you don't have bosons, it has a linear divergence. 
when the when the propagators collide. Right? Right. Yeah, it's, it's due to this fine tuning of the coupling of the fields. Okay, good. So now, <clears throat> yes. If I add this, what a spin? Some, uh, sorry, I have some Wilson loop with some kind of configuration that doesn't preserve supersymmetry. Right. Well, let's say it preserves half the supersymmetry, and I can find some string in some configuration that goes past this. But then something similar, geometrically, I can do something similar, but the string has some kind of configuration that would not preserve any supersymmetry on the Wilson line in the field theory. Some weird configuration. But in any of four super mills, I guess I can do any configuration. I'll always Okay, sometimes, so yeah, you get this, you, you mean this non-supersymmetric with some loops with z zeta equal to zero. Well, okay, you could do this, this, this constructions, but so let, let me table that question for. <coughs> okay, so now, um, so the one half VPS circle, and so what, what do we want to do? We want to match this thing with uh, the localization result. And so let me, so let me take, uh, so this is the circle, then you have this minimal surface on top of it, so this is z equal to zero, this is the center of the circle, this is growing z, and now let me take uh, let me call it, so I apologize for the, for switching the orthodox, the, the canonical names, but okay. Tau and sigma, so let me call it rho and sigma. So then by, by, by symmetry, well my, my picture is not very symmetric, but by symmetry, you, you, you know that these uh, sections of the surface are going to be circles, so you can, uh, you can write down R cosine of sigma, R sine of sigma, zero, zero, and Z R of sigma is just a function of R. So this is, this is your ansatz. Okay, you can compute, uh, let, let me just, uh, let me just uh, skip, I mean, this is in the notes, you can compute the number of action, the induced metric, the equations of motion, and okay, so then you are going to have some equation of motion, that you have to that you have to solve with boundary condition that z of uh, this is r, so z of one has to be equal to zero. So when the radius, so this is the radius r. So when the radius is equal to one, of course, I mean this, this is the radius goes this coordinate r goes like this, right? So when the radius is one, is like the maximum possible, you are on the boundary. So z of one has to be has to be zero. So this is a, some equation of motion with this boundary condition. Okay, so this is a way of doing it. You just solve an equation, but there is another way of doing it, which is a little bit more instructive, which is uh, um, start from a line and do an inversion. So if you have a solution for the line, you are going to find uh, the solution for the circle very simple, very simply. So, <clears throat> so I got an inversion. So this is the operation that I want to do. And uh, so at the boundary, we have uh, that x mu of sigma is equal to cosine of sigma sine of sigma and also, well, okay, so let me, let me remove the circle from the origin. I don't like to have it at the origin, so let me translate it up, plus one. So now if I, if I invert this, this is going to be cosine of sigma, two, one plus, 
uh, sine of sigma one half. Okay, so this uh, inversion that happens at the boundary can be extended to an uh, ADS isometry. So in the bulk, I've got I ADS, which now depends on the big Z, big X and Z. And uh, so now this isometry is going to be X squared, X squared plus Z squared, Z X squared plus Z squared. Okay, so this is, this is the, the inversion of the boundary extends as an ADS isometry, in which I can do the same inversion, but involving more coordinates. Okay, so now what do we have to do? We just have to, so we take a line. So the, 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 solu the, the minimal surface for the line is trivial. It's just a, an infinite sheet going into ADS. So this is the sigma direction. This is the z direction. And uh, so x mu of tau and sigma is going to be sigma 1 half and z of tau and sigma is going to be tau. Good, so the inversion gives you big X mu of tau and sigma for sigma, one plus four sigma squared plus tau squared, 1 minus 4 Very good. So actually what I did here I also translated back so I, I was removing the circle from the origin, and now uh, I do the inversion, I move it, I move it. So I, I, had, I had this shift in the, in the line, so the line was not at sigma zero, it was sigma one half, and now I move, I move it back just to remove, just to avoid the origin. Okay, so this is a hemisphere. So we, we, uh, Uh, we, we find hemispheres, as you would imagine. Now, note that x squared plus z squared is equal to 1. Then you find that z squared is equal to 1 minus big X squared, which is 1 minus R squared, OK? So this solves the equation of motion that I didn't write down, but this, this, this would solve that equation of motion that is in the notes. So now we need to we need to compute the on shell action. So the, the on shell action is the integral from zero to two pi, d sigma, integral from zero to r at a cutoff epsilon, dr, r over one minus r square three halves. So r epsilon is such that when z equal to epsilon, so r epsilon has to be equal to one minus epsilon squared from this equation. Right? So then the, the minimal is the limit epsilon going to zero of this a minus two pi over epsilon. So this is the length of the circle divided by epsilon. I'm regularizing, but doing the Legendre transform would give you the same answer. So this is the limit epsilon going to zero, two pi integral between zero, one minus epsilon square root, r dr. 1 minus r squared 3 half minus 1 over epsilon. You plug it into, well, you do this integral, 
and you find minus 2 pi. OK? Good. So now, you find that this is, so in, in this limit of lambda going to infinity, this is uh, e to minus square root of lambda to pi, this was the prefactor in front of an Ambugoto, I mean in the Ambugoto action in the times minus two pi. So you find e to the square root of lambda. And this matches precisely the leading behavior of the Bessel function that I wrote down in the beginning of the lecture, okay? Okay, so remember, so the, the, this, uh, we had, so the leading behavior was, was like this, was uh, square root of 2 over pi, uh, lambda minus 3 quarters, e to the square root of lambda. So we managed very easily to reproduce this e to the square root of lambda, OK? So now, of course, you would like also to understand the other, the other pieces in this, in this expansion of the Bessel function, right? And this is going to be the subject of uh, <coughs> maybe a couple of, of talks next, next week um, in which, okay, so this, is, this, is, this was quite easy to understand. Now reproducing this thing is, is actually turned out to be a, a long-standing problem. And uh, you know there's progress recently, but uh, we still don't have a really very very you know solid understanding of. So you can interpret this in terms of zero modes of some residual SL2R symmetry that survives. So I, I didn't tell you, but uh, so this uh, this uh, the string as a as a worksheet with induced metric, which is, which is an ADS2. So there is some residual SL2R symmetry, which has some generators, every generator contributes to some power of lambda or h bar in a sense. And uh, okay, so you can, you can argue where this comes from, but you know, getting, getting this number is actually very, very difficult. Anyway, so you're going to learn more about this, uh, this uh, uh, next time. Okay, so just let, also let me uh, give you a, a comment about uh, the matrix model. So if you remember the maximum eigenvalue that we had in the matrix model was lambda over four pi squared. So, the, so the, we had a Wigner semicircle distribution and this, this endpoint here was square root of lambda over four pi squared. And so you see immediately that, so you have this two pi, so this, this is square root of lambda over two pi you multiply with this two pi and you get square root of lambda. So the contribution of the matrix model is the contribution from this point, essentially. Because essentially this distribution is exponentially peaked to the, to the, uh, to the right, okay? So this, is, this, is the point, this point is what, what gives you this. Okay, good. So in the, in the next uh, 10 minutes, <clears throat> let me start uh, exploring something more interesting than the string. Well, this is very interesting, especially understanding this is, is very, very interesting. But let me talk about so-called giant Wilson loops. Okay, so I, I, I guess I repeated many times that uh, we can take different representations of the Wilson loop because taking different representation gives us new parameters and access to different directions in which we can explore holography. So in the exercise, you were asked to compute the matrix model in this case, in which I've got a, a symmetric representation of rank K and uh, anti-symmetric representation as well of rank K. 
So this is AK and SK. And now we can take K to be order N. Okay? <clears throat> so this is still subleading. compared to the Wigner distribution, or if you want to n equal to four super, to the action of n equal to four superior mills. So we can just uh, evaluate the integral of the Wigner distribution with these particular insertions. And in the exercises, you were asked to introduce some generating function of these uh, representations and, and evaluate this, uh, this thing. But now, if we take this, so, the, so we discover that when r is equal to, to, to a single box, so we had one string. So we are led to think that every box in the Young tableau represents one string. So when I have this row or this column, I'm taking combinations of K strings, okay? And when I take combinations of the K strings, interesting thing, things can happen, okay? <clears throat> so in particular, the string that we are considering can grow extra cycles. So this is uh, a known effect in, in, uh, in, uh, in holography where you have Ramon Ramon background forms. This is called Meyer's effect. It's, a, it's, it's like a polarization of, of string direction. So you have a string that grows extra cycles. So let's try to understand what, what can happen from symmetry. <clears throat> so take the gauge theory operator. This can be either the line or the circle. It's going to be the same analysis, I mean, it's going to be the same upshot, except that the, the symmetries are going to be realized differently in the two cases. But so we have SU22 slash four symmetry of the vacuum. But now you introduce a line. So let's think about the line, which is simpler to, 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 to visualize. So you have a line in the vacuum. So this line is going to break uh, SU2, 2 slash 4 down to SL2R times SO3 times SO5. So now let's, let's understand. So this is just as a geometric object. This is what, what is going to happen. So you have a, so these two guys are the remnants of SO2, 4. So you have a line. So you are going to have a dilatation of the line, translation of the line, and special conformal transformations on the line, so, which is three generators that produce SL2R. And then at every point of the, around every point of the line, you have, an, you have a sphere, an S2, which is going to be the S3. So this is the, the conformal group of the vacuum gets broken down to this by the presence of this geometric object, the line. And then <clears throat> the SO6 of the, of the R symmetry gets broken down to SO5 because if you remember, we took this north pole of the sphere. So I'm taking my string to see that the north pole of the sphere, so I, I, I select one point of the sphere, and this breaks SO6 da, down to SO5, OK? So in terms of uh, isometries, this is ADS2 times S2 times S4, OK? <clears throat> Ah, and of course, I mean, you can do the same analysis for the fermionic generators. And you are going to see that actually it's a half EPS operator. And uh, it preserves 16 supercharges, which are precisely the supercharges in uh, OSP 4 star 4. OK, so this, this is a bosonic subgroup of a supergroup, which has the right supersymmetries and all the right bosonic generators as, as, uh, as that you want. Good, so now we saw that the fundamental string, so the, the string which would be one box of a, of a young tableau, so the string had ADS2 worksheet uh, induced metric. So 
So the having a string means adding an SL2R, means adding a ADS2 factor. But you have an S2 and an S4 that you could, uh, that you could wrap, OK? So you, you immediately see just from symmetries that, I mean, what else can it be? The, the string can, uh, <clears throat> so the fundamental string corresponding to the fundamental representation can either grow to a D3 brain, so this was wrapping an ADS2, this is ADS2 times S2, or it could, it could grow into a D5 brain wrapping an ADS2 times S4. So it can only be D3 or D5. There's no other option, right? Of course, now the question is, OK, what is this? So is this AK or SK? And then is this AK or SK or maybe I don't know, some other representation with K, K blocks, with K, K boxes. I don't know what it is. So in order to really understand this, and it took some time, I mean, of course, there, there was some intuition in the early days of this analysis, but it took some time to really sort things out, and you have to do something more, more precise. For example, you have to consider brain intersections in which you have D and D3 brains plus a probe D3 or D5. You write down really the defect conformal field theories on these intersections, then you integrate out fields and you discover, okay, this is equivalent to inserting what in the path integral. And then you discover, after you do this analysis, that uh, actually we can answer this question. And this is the symmetric representation SK, and this is the anti-symmetric representation AK. Okay, I, I cannot really go through the details of how you discover this, but I can give you a piece of evidence that this guy, this, fr from, the, from the holographic point of view, I can give you a piece of evidence that this, is, that this is correct. And so then by exclusion, I guess, you can take the other one to be, to be SK. OK? OK, so we really haven't, haven't uh, said much about uh, OK, so uh, I've got three minutes. So just let me tell you, OK, how do you, how do you see the string charge in this brain? So right, because now you, you think about having many strings. So let's say, think about having, uh, heuristically again, think about having this fundamental string landing on the line, on the, on the, on the circle. Now, now you add k of them one on top of each other, right? So now you have, you have k strings. But of course, they can, they can interact in very complicated ways. And it turns out that the interaction between these strings is going to be captured by, by, by these d3 and d5 brains. Right. So why this really happens, I think nobody really understands so because you have an effective description so this could be something very very complicated of course imagine you have coincident worksheets with all possible you know branch cuts or points of intersection or handles whatever but uh, it turns out that uh, a dbi action captures this picture okay okay so now let me let me just tell you how to see so how to capture the in the last minute or so how to see the. Um, but these K coincident strings capture both the pictures of the, of the SK and the AK? No, no, it, it, they don't really. So they, they are really relevant for the. So the multi wound, multi -wound <laughs> string is for. Again, this was something that took some time to sort out. You have to look really carefully about all the subtle points in the, in the matrix model to understand what is the difference between the multi-wind and symmetric. But anyway, so now is this, this is just to, to try to understand how you have this effective description in terms of a D, of a D, D brain action or DBI action for something which is a priori something different. It's just multiple strings which are combined tensional in order to give you some particular representation of a gauge group. Sorry? Many people, OK, so let's see. Uh, so le I'm going to tell you the name. Yamaguchi, Drucker, Fiol, Gomez, Passerini. There's lots of people I work. So in particular, associating what, what, what is what in a, in a nice way is Gomez Passerini, but finding solutions 
for this thing is Yamaguchi, Drucker Fjol, and many people have worked on it. Um, okay, so. <clears throat> So this, this k, so we have this parameter k in the, in the representation that it has to have a counterpart in holography. So now, what is k in holography? And k is going to be k units of uh, string flux uh, across the relevant sphere that is going to appear in the, in, the, in the solution, okay? And so in order to understand precisely what I have to do, so let me write the DBI action, which is, so the tension of a brain, dp plus one sigma, determinant of g mu nu plus b mu nu plus one over the tension of a fundamental string, f mu nu. So this is a vol volume gauge field. This is the B field. <clears throat> so it's a pullback of the B field and, and the metric. Uh, okay, then expand this, expand this to linear order in the B field. And so this thing contains a term which is the fundamental string, D, D plus one sigma, B mu nu, pi mu nu, where pi mu nu is uh, DBI, del dBi del f mu nu. So we need to compare this with a string action, which, uh, which has a coupling to the B field, which is Tf, Tf1. Then you have I in Euclidean signature, BAB epsilon AB. So you want to compare these two things. So you, you see that the, 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 the D brain will carry the right, the right amount of string flux if you take uh, the integral over SP minus one, DP minus one sigma, pi AB equal IK over two epsilon AB. Okay? So this tells you essentially that, okay, so in the case of a D3 brain, you have to integrate across VS2. For the D5 brains, you integrate across VS4. This, uh, this uh, uh, momentum conjugate to the vol volume gauge field, and, and you put it equal to K. So this is where K enters holographically. K is the charge associated to the strings that have been dissolved into this D brain. Okay, so you understand that P, P mu nu, or if you want F mu nu, has to have only components. So P mu nu has components only along the string directions. So the, 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 the directions of a worksheet. And okay, so this is where K enters. Okay, so now what you have to do essentially is to just repeat what we have done for the string in this more complicated setup. So you have to compute the DBI action. There's a Vesumino term that you have to include. There are all these uh, Legend transformations that you have to do. And you do them, you compute the action of the, of the brain on shell. Uh, it's going to be finite after you include this this, uh, I mean, it actually is going to be finite by itself, the DBI action as a divergence that cancels against the divergence of the Vesumino term. But anyway, after you include all the Legend transforms, you recover the result that uh, should have been uh, your answer from the matrix model point of view. I'm going to do it tomorrow, okay? So tomorrow I'm going to do this. I'm going to sketch how you do these computations for the D3 and D5 brain. And then, I, then we are going to see what happens when you take even larger representations, when you, instead of having n boxes, you have n square boxes, so now, now you have a back reaction on the geometry. And then we are going to do an, uh, a, a nice, uh, we're going to talk about nice connections between 
seemingly different operators that you could consider like deformations of the line or of the circle, Bremsstrahlung functions, Wilson loops with cusps, or latitude Wilson loops, and they are all connected in a very nice way. And uh, you, you can also use localization in, in those examples, okay? So thanks. <laughs>